Well, this morning I want to talk about a subject that you might initially misunderstand. I want to talk about the house of prayer as our eternal identity. And the reason I say you might misunderstand it, I'm not at all actually talking about IHOP our ministry, International House of Prayer of Kansas City. I'm talking about something far bigger, far more important. And so I don't want you to kind of, in your heart, say, oh, I kind of got that one, because I, I want to take it a little different place. I'm talking about capital I, I hop, not little I, I hop. And our ministry is little I. I'm talking about the eternal identity, the eternal identity of the people of God, whether they're ever involved in an I hop, We are called, by God, forever, we are called the house of prayer. It has massive implications on the way that we relate to God now, and it gives us clarity as to how we're going to relate to God in the age to come. It says in Isaiah 56, verse 7, he says, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain. He's talking about the foreigners, and we'll look at this in a few moments. Because the foreigners are the ones that... They were idolatrous demon worshipers whose lives were steeped in immorality and darkness. He said, I am going to so cleanse them. I'm going to so connect them to me. It will be a miracle of grace. But what I'm going to do, verse 7, even them, those that have the darkest, most jaded, polluted spirit, I will do such a work in them. I will bring them to my holy mountain. And so the strength of the, of the promise, I will bring them. I will anoint them. I will help them. So I want to underline the word bring. Like the Lord said, I will make them fishers, uh, fishers of men. It's this idea of divine activity. I promise you, I will make a way and I will carry them by the anointing to this destiny. I will bring them. To my holy mountain, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. And here's the statement that we're so familiar with at IHOP, but maybe we're not really that familiar with what it means. And that's what I want to alert you to. It's bigger than what I think or what you were thinking. The Lord says, For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Paragraph A. The highest identity of the redeemed, now and in eternity. The highest identity for the redeemed, the body of Christ, for all eternity, is that we would walk and function before God as a house of prayer. That we would engage in in intimacy-based intercession as the sons of God before the Father... And as the bride of Christ before the, the son, the bridegroom king, we would rule the nations in the age to come. And of course, we're doing it now in the limited way of which we release the government of God. And we do release the government of God. And it's dynamic and important. Changes history now. But it is going to be ultimate in the age to come. We will do it through intercession that's based in intimacy with God. Paragraph B, what Isaiah is talking about, he's telling these foreigners, these that are outside of the commonwealth of Israel, these Gentile idol worshipers, he says, do you understand how far the grace of God is going to take you? Do you see where this thing is going? Now, uh, paragraph B, we were created by God, to live in a deep interaction with God's heart. Now, here's what it means to be a house of prayer. Here's what it means. God speaks, and it moves our heart. Then we speak, and it moves his heart. And then he opens up his hand or his treasury and releases his resource into the natural realm. Let me say that again. This is what it means to be the house of prayer in time and in eternity. But I'm actually focusing on, for a moment, eternity, the age to come. Because some people imagine that the house of prayer is a ministry focus that is going to become more 
prominent the closer we get to the coming of the Lord. And that is true, but that's a secondary thing. It is far more than a ministry focus that's growing in prominence. It is our eternal identity with resurrected bodies in the age to come on this physical material earth. What will happen? God will speak. It will move our heart. Talking about resurrected saints with physical, material, resurrected bodies on the earth. He will speak. It will move us. Wow. We will speak. It will move him. Wow. He opens his hand and releases his infinite resource into the natural realm. Now, the the resource is all his. But he refuses to release it outside of the context of this interaction. Now, the resource of God, I have in paragraph B, is vast. It's not only money. The resource of God is wisdom. It's creative ideas. When God gives you or I a creative idea for our family, for our friends, for the, for the marketplace, whenever you get a creative idea, that's part of God's resource. Another part of his resource I have written here is unity. It is a miracle when people are unified in the spirit, whether, it, whether a marriage, a family, or a ministry. Or a marketplace assignment. It doesn't matter. It is a miracle when people are unified in the Spirit. That is the hand of God. That's part of God's resource. Zeal for righteousness. Favor in ministry. Ministry impact. All of these are aspects of God's resource. And here's what God's saying. I will release these into the natural realm. To the degree... That I speak and it moves your heart, and you speak and it moves my heart, then I open my hand. He goes on to say, in the, in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 2, we'll get there in a few moments, but I'll just quote it to you now, because you know it well. In James, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, you do not have because you do not ask. And what the Lord is, is doing, he says, I'm not going to open my hand if you don't ask. Not because I don't know you have a need. Not because I can't see it. Not because I don't care. It's actually just opposite. The Lord is so jealous for the relationship with his heart and our heart. He will starve us out of prayerlessness by withholding his resource. He says, I'm so jealous for this High identity. I'm so jealous for this dignity of interacting with your heart and my heart that I am going to starve you out of lethargy and prayerlessness by withholding my resource till you stand up before me and speak and move my heart. I want relationship that much. Because what many people do is they are aware of their need. I'm talking about people in the body of Christ. They, they uh, groan over the lack of what is happening in their, in their marriage, their family, their ministry, the marketplace. They, they groan, and the Lord says, come on, take it to the next level. Oh, it's horrible. Come on, go ahead. Keep going. Oh. And then they get busy. He goes, no, no, I'm not going to open my hand till you stand before me and talk to me. Because it's in that place I will transform you, I will connect my heart to you, and it's in that place you will function as the bride of Christ and as sons of God, which is, the, in essence, the coming together of those two parts of our identity is what constitutes being the house of prayer. Because when the Lord says, I will make you a house of prayer, put the word family in the place of house. The house of prayer says, it's my house. When the Lord says, my house, I, you will be my house. And my house is a house of prayer. In essence, he's saying, you will function as my family. Now, we function in two different ways as the family of God. Before the Father, we function as sons of God, male and female. Before the Son, we function as the bride of Christ, male and female. We're both sons of God and, I mean, men and women are both sons of God and the bride of Christ. 
Together they constitute God's house or God's family. But the idea of his house is not only his family, it's the wealth of his house that is implied by the phrase, my house will be a house of prayer. I will release the treasure, the inheritance of my family into the earth through my people being moved when I speak and then moving me when they speak. That is the condition of which I will release my resource into the natural realm. And it's because of my zeal for relationship that I am going to starve my people out of their prayerlessness by, with, by with, uh, restraining my hand. Because I care so much for the relationship, this is what the Lord has declared that he's going to do. Paragraph C. Now the house of prayer in Kansas City, the house of prayer in Kansas City is the church of Kansas City with over a thousand congregations. I have an opportunity every couple of years to speak at the pastor's uh, network. There's about two to three hundred pastors that gather every month, have been for 25 years. And every couple of years I, get a ch- I have an opportunity to speak to them. And I say the same thing, at least this sentence I say every time. As a matter of fact, next week is, is a, I have another opportunity to speak to them. And one of the first things I say, and I want you to, to say this, to get this in your language, I say, the IHOP missions base is not the house of prayer of Kansas City. The house of prayer of Kansas City is the body of Christ in Kansas City. As a thousand plus congregations, IHOP missions base is a gas station. Our function is to squirt... We don't have that much to squirt gas on the fire of the house of prayer of Kansas City. To be a catalyst. To inspire. To call people forth to prayer in a greater way. And there's a number of ministries in the Kansas City area that are called as catalytic ministries to help the overall house of prayer of Kansas City. That the house of prayer of any city is the entire body of Christ of that city. And the reason this is important to say for two reasons. Number one, I I don't want the people that are engaged in a real focused way in a prayer ministry like the House of Prayer, like the IHOP missions base. I don't want them to assume ever in pride just by being mistaken that they are the House of Prayer of the cities. That's the first reason I want to say it. But another reason I want to say it, equally important is that you may be engaged in a prayer ministry for a year or ten years in a real focused way, and the Lord may move you on to be involved in another ministry with a different focus. And if you think this is the house of prayer in this city, then when you're called to another ministry, another part of God's family, you'll say, well, I did the prayer thing for a few years. Now I am in another ministry, and I want to say to you, no matter what ministry it is, Every ministry from God's point of view is a house of prayer in time and in eternity. Now, they may not know it, but if you, if the Lord moves you to another part of his spiritual family, you are still the house of prayer. It's not that, well, I do prayer hard when I'm in the IHOP world, and then if I get shifted, I don't do prayer hard. That's a mistake as to what the definition of the house of prayer is. We are only a gas station. We are a catalytic ministry, and there's thousands of them around the earth that God is raising up that are exaggerated in their focus. They have a heightened focus in order to bring some measure of adjustment in the purpose of God in that city or that region. And the IHOP KC, the missions base I'm talking about, we are not... uh, uh, we, We don't have enough in the grace of God to shift the whole body of Christ... So the Lord's raising up all kinds of prayer ministries that are catalytic and focused on prayer in a heightened, exaggerated way. I mean, more than the majority. And together, we can bring adjustment to the body of Christ and the city in the realm of prayer. And that's what all the prayer ministries are doing. Paragraph D. The church in the nations... So about the whole body of Christ of the earth has not seen her prime, herself and her primary identity as an eternal house of prayer. Most ministries in the nations, they think prayer is important, and most would admit 
with pain, they don't do it very much. Been interacted with leaders for a lot of years, and it's a common thing for the vast majority to say prayer's important, but, oh, I don't like it, I don't do it much. I would think that would be true to many people right here in our mission space. I'm called to prayer, but, ah, as the months go by, I don't do it that much. And my point is that the house, the body of Christ in the earth does not really see who they are as a house of prayer. They still think the house of prayer is a ministry focus that they don't have at this season. It's far more than that. It is our eternal identity forever as the house of God, the family of God, with all of the resource of God, the family with all the resource... One aspect, we're sons of God. Another aspect, we're the bride of Christ. That's all under the family, the house of the Lord. God speaks and moves our heart. We speak, it moves his heart. And in the outflow of that, he opens his hand or his treasury and releases wisdom, zeal for righteousness, unity, impact, transformation. And he'll do that for ever on the basis of the word going from him to us and us back to him. This is a glorious reality. Whatever gets in the way from us being moved by his word, we must confront it. The enemy wants to get on the front end of this equation. He wants to get in the way so the word of God, whether this written word or the more subjective experiences of a prophetic revelation, a dream or a vision, or those kinds of of, uh, ministries of the Holy Spirit. The enemy wants to get in the way so the Word doesn't move us. Because when the Word does not move our heart, then we don't, in a sustained way, stand before him and speak in a way that moves his heart. Well, It's it's not because his heart's not moved, because we don't speak. What happens when the word ceases to move our heart, our vision goes down, and we see our lack with frustration and complaint. But when the word moves our heart, we get a vision for speaking it back. And then when we do speak it back because of God's graciousness, it moves him. And then the other thing that happens, when we speak it back, it marks our spirit when we speak the word back, and it joins us to God and to other people. So it it would be true to say God speaks, it moves our heart. We speak, it moves God's heart, and it moves our heart, and it moves the hearts of others. And it marks us. I love to use the analogy, I've used it for years, of the computer programmer. They may uh, write a new program or change a program and rewrite a million lines of code. And every time we speak the word back to God. It's as simple as I love you or send revival. The simplest phrases, it's like one more line of code rewritten in our inner man, marking our spirit. It's not enough to hear somebody else say it. It actually has to be spoken. You could whisper it. You can mutter it. Oh, God, I love you. This is your glory. It, it doesn't matter. It's law, but it must be spoken. It absolutely must be spoken. Yes, God hears the prayers of our mind, that's for sure. But it's the spoken prayer that marks us. There's something about the constitution, the makeup of the human spirit. When we speak good or bad, it marks us. So the Lord in his zeal, it's not that he can't hear us. He wants us marked and connected to him by speaking back to him. And it moves him when we speak back to him. He says, I won't open my hand or my treasury if you don't do this because of my zeal for relationship with you. Now, the place I I want us to see is that, beloved, this is far more than a ministry focus as we uh, approach the coming of the Lord. It's far more than that. This is the way we will function to change the nations in the millennial kingdom and then in the eternal age afterwards, we will forever function this way. There will never be a time where we will not pray to release the government of God. Never. It's always that way. Matter of fact, as glorious as the prayer movement will be as we get closer to the coming of the Lord and the great crescendo at the end of the age, 
I mean, those final years, the prayer movement will be at a whole nother level of quality and power and impact. Beloved, it will go far beyond in the, in the millennial kingdom. The quality and the power of the prayer movement will go far higher to a whole nother level. When the Lord comes back, he will lead the global prayer movement through the thousand years. And afterwards, he'll bring it up even another notch higher. It is our identity. We're called the house of prayer. We're called that. Who are we called that by? By God. God calls us this. Who else are we called the house of prayer by? By the angels. They see us and they see what's going on. The demons know who we are, but the demons don't want us to know it. We are to see each other as the house of prayer, as the family with the resource, the family of God with the resource of God, that's what the house of God is. Again, there's a son dimension, there's a bride dimension brought together. It's where it comes together in the family of God before the throne. And the father and the son are on the throne and we come before him as the family, the house, and all the resource is included in this family house dynamic. Mark Anderson had a, uh, a, a visitation from the Lord back in March 2004 that he tells regularly as he goes ar- uh, around YWAM to talks to the leaders. And him and his wife, Karen, had the same experience, the same moment. Two different, uh, they, they were in the house. I think they were on the beach. It was in New Zealand. I think they, I, I remember they were on the beach. That doesn't matter. But in the same hour, but separate from each other, they both heard the same word. If it's not the house of prayer, it's not my house. And that's when the Lord told him. Uh, well, a little bit after that, he said, there is no such thing as the missions movement and the prayer movement. It's one movement. If my people do not are not moved by my word to their heart and they do not speak it back and move my heart, there is no movement. That is the essence of all that I do because I'm the God of relationship. So it's, it's all right. It's, I think it's accurate to talk about prayer ministries as long as we know that prayer ministries are catalysts to our prayer identity forever. And we have to understand that. Now, what's happening, paragraph D I have here, is that, <coughs> excuse me, that the Lord is wrestling with the body of Christ right now. Because globally, the vast majority of, uh, the, the uh, vast majority of the body of Christ globally does not see herself as a, themselves as a house of prayer. They do not see it. So the Lord's wrestling. Right now, there's a big wrestling match going on in the body of Christ. It's, it's parallel to what happened when Jacob, in Genesis 32, was wrestling with the Lord. Now, we know the word Jacob, most of you, it means supplanter or twister or in popular kind of uh, terminology, manipulator. And it's not just that he was a manipulator before people. He just interpreted his, his life on the earth through his own self-absorbed lens. Everything was about him. And that is actually the mindset of anybody except the Holy Spirit helps us. We are all a Jacob of sorts. Maybe not to the degree, my guess is he was really gifted at it, really skilled at manipulating. But in the general sense, born-again believers, we view our life through a paradigm that it's about us. It's about our comfort, our influence, our, our, the way people relate to us. And the Lord goes, I want to wrestle with you. I want to wrestle with you. I want to change your name from Jacob or supplanter. I want to change your name to Israel. That's what happened in Genesis 32. He wrestled and he changed his name to Prince with God. The Lord says, I want to wrestle with my church. And that's what he's doing right now. There's going to be a lot of collisions and a lot of disruption before the Lord returns in the church. He's going to change the understanding and expression of of the Christianity of the earth. And I believe that one of the key things he's doing, he's causing the church to wrestle and get a new name. Whether it's an outreach ministry, a marketplace ministry, a family building ministry, a feeding the poor ministry, everyone will see themselves as the house of prayer. Meaning, 
They are called to stand and hear the word and be moved. Speak it back. Move God. And then his hand opens and God's government's released in the earth out of that dynamic. It's a huge wrestling match. That's kind of a cool thing to say. But it's terrifying to me to think of the implications of the great collision that's emerging in the earth right now. The Lord will not allow his church to end natural history before the second coming of Christ. He will not allow us to end without a clarity on a global level as to who we are as the house of prayer. He's jealous for it. The Lord will not release his resource. He will not release his resource except we come in intercession. I want to say it differently than intercession. I want to say it intimacy-based intercession. It's the intercession that says, I love you, you love me. I love you, you love me. It's the intercession that agrees with how lovable and great he is and then agrees with his promises. We agree with who he is. That's the I love you, you are great. And then we agree with his promises, release revival. It's intimacy-based intercession. It's not intimacy without intercession, and it's not intercession without intimacy. Not that every minute of every day is both of them. My point is, that's what the house of prayer is. I love you, I love you. Holy, 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 you are great. You love me, you love me, you love me. Oh, release your wisdom and your power and unify us. The Lord requires that we speak the word back. Paragraph F. The Lord will not come back. The Lord will not come back until his church knows who she is and functions in the anointing of her identity as the house of prayer. Why? Because it's in this identity that the powers of evil, the Antichrist empire, will be confronted and brought down. It will be in the overflow of the church on the earth, the church in heaven, under the leadership of Jesus, the great intercessor, working together in concert under his leadership, the powers of all the evil governments of the earth will be brought down in a manifest way before the eyes of all. But it's not just that intercession is vital, the house of prayer dynamic is, uh, a dynamic is vital to the to the earthly manifestation of the defeat of the Antichrist empire. It's more than that. The Lord, the Lord does not want us transitioning into the age to come without clarity as to who we are. We are far more than a preaching community. We do preach. Preaching is critical. We'll preach forever. It's far more than a serving community. Serving is, 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 is forever. It's very important. I'm not minimizing that. We are first and foremost those that are moved by his word and we speak and move his heart and then he opens his resource. That is our highest place of identity. It's our highest place of authority. It's our highest place of security. God is so jealous for this reality. He wants us to declare war on everything that gets in the way of shutting this down at the heart level. Beloved, there's a thousand things from bitterness to anxiety to pornography to slander to complaints to just too much entertainment, unfocused life and the use of our time. There's so many things that are calculated to shut our spirits down so we are not moved. Because if we're not moved... We don't speak back and then God's not moved. He watches. He watches and goes, oh, do you see the glory of who you are? But I will starve you out of your prayerlessness by withholding my resource till you stand up to the dignity and the glory of who you are before me. Paragraph F. Now we know the famous passage. We say it all the time around here. So many of us do that the spirit of the bride say, come. Jesus is not coming in a vacuum. He's coming when his church in a bridal identity is in intercession and worship. Come, Lord Jesus. Come near us, intimacy. Come to us, revival in our city or nation. Come for us, the second coming. We're crying come at every prayer meeting. Even in worship, I love you, I love you. We're beckoning him to come touch our hearts. Even when we say, I love you, I love you, that is a form of beckoning him to touch us. Come near us. Touch my heart. 
I love you, I love you, I love you. What I mean is, I want to feel your love more and I love you. You know, it's, we're, we're, we're saying, even in that prayer that we don't use the language, we're saying, come near us. Come, Lord Jesus, come near us. We pray for the city, we pray for the nation, we pray for the nations of the earth. We're saying, come to us in power. But that prayer ultimately is answered, come for us at the second coming. Come and rescue the nations and turn everything around. Come for us globally and turn the entire situation around on the earth. Paragraph G, of course most most of you know this passage well, but I, I want it to be uh, everybody's favorite verse. One of those, you know, hundred favorite verses. You get a hundred. Isaiah 42, this is, I tell you, it is the grand prophecy in the Old Testament about the prayer movement. There's few of them, but this one is at the top of the list in the Old Testament. This is the Old Testament version of the Spirit of the Bride say, come Lord Jesus. Most of you know it, but I just want you to see it anyway. Verse 10, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the ends of the earth. Go down to the sea, all that is in it. That he names now seven areas, which I don't have them all here on the notes. You can read Isaiah 42 on your own. The coastlands, the wilderness, the cities, and all the different areas, they're crying out with love songs. And what happens in verse 13? The Lord will go forth like a mighty man of war. That's the second coming of Christ. And he will destroy the powers of darkness in an open way. Now, he's already defeated them at the cross, but he will destroy them openly in history, in time and space, in real time in the natural realm. He will manifest that victory in all the nations of the earth. Verse 13, the Lord will go forth like a mighty man. Jesus is going forth as a mighty man, not in a vacuum. That's Again, that's the second coming. He's coming in answer to a global prayer movement. This is the Old Testament version of the Spirit of the Bride say come. In the New Testament, we're called a bride, so that implies the love songs. In the Old Testament, it's, it's the new song. It's the songs that have government and power where God is shifting history. God, Jesus is only coming when he hears the songs because out of the love songs will emerge the, 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 the cry of war, the war cry. The war cry fl- flows out of the love songs. Let's go uh, to the next uh, page. Roman numeral two, paragraph uh, A. Jesus will rule through intercession through the millennial kingdom and beyond. Hebrews 7.25. We know that Jesus, Hebrews 7.25, he lives forever to make intercession. In other words, my point being, we all know these passages, he will be interceding. He will lead a global prayer movement in the age to come, and then it will go up another notch in the eternal age. Prayer is not something we're doing until the Lord returns. It is going to grow. But beloved, we're at the beginning of the prayer movement in terms of history. In terms of billions and billions of years of human history, we're at the beginning. We're in the basement level of it. It's here to stay. Psalm 2. David had revelation of the interaction between the Father and the Son. And the Lord, that's the Father, said to me, the Son, you are my Son. This is the Father talking to Jesus and David eavesdropping. What a glorious spirit of prophecy. How would you like to eavesdrop into it? A dialogue within the Trinity. My goodness. So he heard the father said, you're my son. And Jesus, yes. And then the father goes on, he says, ask of me, oh my son, and I will give you nations. Now this clearly is something Jesus is doing for the great harvest at the end of the age. But I tell you, it's the intercession of Jesus. Look at verse 9 that will be used to break nations with a rod in the tribulation. It's Jesus' intercession that's breaking the nations. And it's the church in, in unity with him. He will dash the nations to pieces wherever there's unrighteousness. And there will be places where there will be righteousness in the nations. 
Don't assume that, all, that it's, 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 it's uh, all going to be uh, wrong. There will be strongholds and there will be breakthroughs in righteousness. And those areas of the nations do not need to be dashed. But the point I wanted you to get is that the end time movement of dashing nations and rebuilding nations in the millennial kingdom is released through intercession. Even Jesus is asking the Father each step of the process he asked the Father. We would think he would wave his hand and that would be it. And Jesus continues ruling in the millennium in the same relationship or the same dynamic as he did in Genesis 1. Here it is in Genesis 1. The Father has the plan. I'm going to create the heavens and the earth with fullness. So the Father has the plan. The Spirit's hovering over the earth with all the power of God. I mean, the Holy Spirit has all the power of God. He is God. He's hovering. The Father says, I've already okayed the plan. Not just to create the heavens and the earth, but the fullness thereof to be fully established with goodness and life. So the Father has said yes. The Spirit's present. I mean, He's hovering. He's present. I mean, the, come Holy Spirit. He's there all over the nations and He can do it easily. And they're waiting for one thing, for the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, to utter the word that was in the Father's heart. And the Son says, let there be light. The Spirit goes, yes! Boom! Light comes. Whoa! The angels shout for joy, it says in Job 38. They, whoa, they, they sing for joy. Well, Jesus is in the same relationship. In the, in the dashing and the reconstruction of nations, at the end of the age, in the millennial kingdom, he has to speak it. The father says, oh, son, it's the same thing as Genesis 1. You have to tell me. And your people together with you, they must talk to me. They must speak back to me. And then I open my hand and release resource. The spirit will move. Why? Because I want relationship in my house. Because it's my house and it's my resource. And my house will foremost be those connected to my heart. This is so much bigger than a prayer ministry focus. It's our eternal identity. Look at this passage in Psalm 72. This is a strange passage. If you're unfamiliar with, with what's going on. This is King Solomon speaking in Psalm 72. And he says, and he, talking about the messianic king that would be yet a thousand years after Solomon's life. He, he's prophesying, he shall live. And the gold of Sheba will be given to him. Prayer will be made for him continually. What? Prayer for Jesus in the millennial kingdom? What? And daily he will be praised in all the nations. But I want to lock, lock into this. Prayer will be made for him. You know, when I first began to search this passage out, I checked every commentary I could. On the book of Psalms, Psalm 72, and every one of them, you know, either they ignored it or they kind of spit and sputtered and, (coughs) well, uh, and they tried to, a couple of them said, surely it can't mean for him. But then the guys would say, yeah, but the Hebrew says for, but maybe the text was altered by the scribes when they were passing down the manuscripts. It can't mean for him. And it does mean for him. Now, I don't think it means that Jesus himself lacked anything because the fullness of God is in him, even in his humanity. But what I believe it is, it's talking about for his administration. Jesus has a, a whole network of government leaders around the earth. And Jesus says, pray that the sphere given to me is increased in resource and power. I am praying and I want the nations praying with me for my governmental leaders. It's kind of the first Timothy 2.1 in the millennial kingdom. Pray first of all for those in government. And so when we pray for Jesus, what I believe we're doing is we're not praying for the man Jesus. Because Colossians 2.9 says the fullness of God dwells in him in bodily form. But I believe we're praying for those that he has appointed in his sphere, his his sphere of authority. He's saying, it's kind of like us asking for someone, pray for our ministry. We're talking about for all the people connected together. The nations will be praying for all of those 
that are, 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 are in the downline of Jesus' authority. That's what I assume that this means. The reason I say assume, anytime you talk about subjects related to the Godhead, you have to be careful and you have to be walk tenderly. But I'm not prepared to delete this verse, to make it nothing. I believe that in the age to come, prayer will be so dynamic and so powerful. Look at paragraph D. We'll move angels and demons by prayer in this age. We'll move angels in the age to come by prayer. The demons will be thrown in prison, then they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. We don't have to worry about them. Here's what Daniel, here's what the angel says to Daniel, chapter 10, verse 12. Daniel, from the first day you set your heart on this 21-day fast to humble yourself, your words were heard. Listen, here's what the angel says. I came because of your words. I came because you said things. Now, we would kind of think, well, I thought it. The Lord says, no. Jesus could have said before the Father in Genesis 1, Father, of course I was thinking, let there be light. The Holy Spirit says, I can't release light until it's spoken. You are the Word of God. You must speak it. You're the embodiment of the Father's plan. You must speak it. Surely there was no need for that dialogue within the Trinity. But the point being, in the, even in the age to come, in the millennial kingdom, Jesus must ask each step of the way. Continually, prayer will go forth. Prayer movement in the age to come will go to a whole other level. Our prayer ministries with resurrected bodies will go to a whole other level. Prayer won't be obsolete because we're face to face. Prayer will be more urgent than ever when we're face to face. We will see its potential like never before. It's not obsolete. It's more urgent and relevant than ever when we're face to face before him. Paragraph E. Human history began in a prayer meeting. In the Garden of Eden, there's a man. His name's Adam. He's been given the dominion mandate to govern the earth. I mean to bring uh, dominion, God's dominion to the earth. To establish the the human government over it. So he's walking in the garden. Day by day. Walking. Talking to the Lord. Lord. What's in your heart? The Lord says, say this. Lord, do this. Release it. Day by day in the cool of the garden. Adam. It's a prayer meeting. Human history begins in a prayer meeting. Paragraph F. Israel as a nation. After they came out of Egypt. What happens? The first thing, they go to a mountain in in Exodus 19. They go to a mountain. The mountain's on fire. Thunder and lightning, just like the throne. The thunder and lightning around the throne in Revelation 4 is breaking forth in the natural, in the mountain. The mountain is a picture of the throne. Obviously with much limitation, but it's a picture of the throne. And the nation of Israel is before the the throne, in essence, and thunder and lightning, and God's talking to them, and they're answering back, we're committed, yes, we will, yes, we will. He says, you're a nation of priests. You will stand before me in this posture forever. Yes, we get it. We're yours. We will obey you. It begins in a prayer meeting. That's the first thing that happens after the Red Sea that's significant is they have a prayer meeting. Then Moses is called to go higher up the mountain, On another another occasion, not long after, God meets him face to face in Exodus 25 and says the strangest thing you can imagine. Here he is on the mountain face to face with God. The glory of God. And God says, go down and take up an offering. I mean, when I first read that, I thought, that can't be. Take up an offering. What? And build me a sanctuary for worship. So the first thing that happens that Israel's past the Red Sea, they have a prayer meeting at the mountain at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19. Uh, Just a little while later, Moses ascends the mountain. God says, go down and build me a house of prayer. The first building program in redemptive history, I mean from Egypt on, build me a house of prayer. I want a tent. I want a tent of meeting where they could come before me and worship me and I could speak to them. Jesus, paragraph G, he began his ministry, his messianic ministry, in a a wilderness for 40 days in a wilderness fasting. Praying, 
It's all about prayer. Him and the Father talking. He begins his ministry in a prayer meeting, and he ends his public ministry or his messianic ministry before the cross in a prayer meeting in the Garden of Gethsemane. He begins and ends in a prayer meeting. The book of Acts, the church, begins in a prayer meeting in Acts uh, Acts 2. 120 intercessors. The church is born in a prayer meeting, and it ends with global concerts of prayer. The Spirit of the Bride says, come. And then we go on into the age to come in our identity. We are called the house of prayer. For we are the people that God moves our heart. We speak. God moves our heart. Then we speak. We sp- and then as we speak, it moves his heart. He moves our heart by his word. Then we speak and we move his heart. He releases his resource. We, we continue in that forever and forever and forever. Beloved, just in conclusion, worship team, come on up. We have to declare war against everything that gets in the way that shuts our spirit down. So the word doesn't move our heart. Because when the word doesn't move our heart, we don't speak back. What we do is we fret, we're frustrated, and we complain to one another. The Lord says, no, 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 take it up, take it up, bring it to me. I'm listening. You must speak to me. Again, you don't have to do it. You can mutter it. I mean, you can whisper it. You can do anything, but it has to be more than a thought. He wants it to be spoken. The word of God governs the whole created order. It must be spoken. We must say, even in the softest way, Lord, Lord, do it. Do it. Lord says, I'll give you much more to your family, much more to your ministry, much more. I will release angels. I'm not hearing your voice. Isaiah 30, verse 18, the Lord said, when I hear the sound of your voice, then I will do it that I'll do it. I'm going to starve you out of prayerlessness because I'm so jealous that we would interact at this level forever and forever and forever. Amen. Let's stand.